Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our Fuel Arts regular weekly online webinars devoted to the intersection of art and technology, where we are trying to merge the two worlds, the world of art tech and uh, VC capital. So when saying we, I mean Sonia Stubblebine, project manager at Fuel Arts, and me, Dennis Belkevich, uh, co-founder and general partner at Fuel Arts. So as you know, um, our uh, last webinars have been focused on the diversity of the Tezos ecosystem, and those webinars are constantly introducing you to the managers, curators, founders, artists, and technical experts working to develop the number one blockchain for arts, which is definitely Tezos. Um, also, I'd like to remind you that uh, two weeks ago, we've published our report, report on the uh, investments, cumulative investments in the art tech sphere. So please feel free to uh, follow this QR code and uh, download it. It's uh, free for, for the needs of the art tech and VC uh, society. So um, in the same weeks, we're continuing working with the startups of the first batch of uh, the Fuel Arts and Tezos Accelerator. Please don't hesitate uh, visiting our social networks and the website uh, following the latest news. And we're happy that the 10 startups um, chosen for the batch uh, have already uh, shown good results on their way to the demo day and for the development after uh, April 27th. So um, I, I'm happy to um, introduce you to the partners of uh, the uh, Fuel Arts and Talus Accelerator. There are three layers of the partners. Uh, first, organizational partners, Amadeo Global, a New York-based investment firm focused on public and private companies. Educate Me, a Ukrainian startup that gathers live sessions, uh, lessons, content, and assignments uh, in a single place. Um, Unstoppable Domains, uh, Domains, our infrastructural partner of the batch, uh, which offers NFT domains that give people full ownership and control on their digital identity. Uh, Tetris Art Management, a team of producers and strategists managing international art projects and delivering PR services. Um, the tech part and the, 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 the part uh, represented mostly by the uh, companies um, inside the Tezos ecosystem, Trilly Tech, a company dedicated to developing and elevating new ideas and innovation built on the Tezos ecosystem, Nomadic Labs, tech partner of the Batch, one of the largest research and development centers within the Tezos ecosystem, our tech partner from Germany, Rider Button, uh, they are successfully developing the most complex, ambitious, and scalable projects. And NAN is a fun, simple, and secure way to create a Tezos wallet. Uh, then we have one of our uh, media uh, mass media partners, Metaverse Post. Uh, they are supplying the market with the hottest Web3 news. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't done that before and be the first to know the, the hottest news. So, and the four last startups are represented by the mentors who are helping the startups of the um, Pilar Santas Accelerator to gain their uh, skills and knowledge on the way to success. Blockchain Art, represented by Christina Steinbrecher Fund. Bull Perks, represented by Konstantin Kogan. Art Pay, uh, represented by Natasha Rotman Letonur. And Art Cryption, represented by Vandana Taksali. So let's um, introduce you to our today's guest. Uh, it's our pleasure to welcome the representative of one of the top galleries in the world. Let's uh, change the geographical focus from uh, the central ecosystem to uh, the United Kingdom, to London, to the Serpentine Gallery. So I'm happy to welcome today Kay Watson, a researcher, producer, and curator working with art and advanced technologies, photography and video games. Yeah, we know it's all about gamify uh, nowadays. Um, Kay is uh, currently head of arts technologies at Serpentine. And there she leads um, the arts and tech program and a trustee of a Brighton Photo Fringe uh, mm -hmm. and the Photographer's Gallery. 
Hi, Kay, and thank you for joining us. We're happy to, to know more about the experience of yours and the experience of uh, one of the top art galleries who, who made incredible uh, steps from Web 2 to Web 3. Thank you. I mean, I think it, uh, it's important to say that I think we are also in the same process as everyone else. You know, we are trying to understand. We're at this interesting moment of sort of worlds colliding and bridging worlds. And we're just very happy that the art field in general can have a role um, in in how this evolves. So, but you have to be a... here. But you have a significant compatible advantage in the face of Hans Ulrich Obrist, the chief curator of Serpentine. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, but also, you know, um, the the capabilities that have been built by the organization over the last 10 years with regards to, um, you know, what we might have called uh, digital art, which we now call Art te arts technologies at Serpentine. So um, it's, yes, very much down to good leadership and the sort of building out capabilities and the bringing in of knowledge and sharing that knowledge with the wider sector. So, um, yeah, we are very privileged is all I'll say. <laughs> Thank you. Th th thank you, Kay. So um, let us start asking you questions, you know, that, that's a webinar where we are asking questions. So the first question will be, uh, yeah, you, you've started. You've started telling about the, the Serpentine's uh, steps towards Web three, but um, just a general one. Um, when and how did Serpentine start experimenting with advanced tech? So I think it began in earnest. So there have been earlier moments where, uh, because we're an artist led organization, where artists have come to us and said you know, we want to do this project and um, we tried to make that happen. But the kind of evolution as we, we reach today really began 10 years ago now uh, with a conversation and sort of an ongoing conversation between Hans Ulrich and um, someone called Ben Vickers, who was previously CTO at the Serpentine. Um, and that conversation began as what what does the art institution of the 22nd century look like? Um, and from there, um, this has, and you know, I'm really thinking about what is the role in of technology beyond just, you know, the kind of operational side on, uh, of the way things function and beyond just the curatorial side in the way uh, that things function. And how can we be looking at both of those things in tandem? So um, 10 years ago, that began with, um, in 2013, um, we opened our second building, uh, Serpentine North. And at that point, we launched a series of digital commissions. Now, that's quite a, this was quite a, you know, it's, it's been an iterative and gradual process, much of which has been based around the fact that, you know, we've been building knowledge and building those capabilities along the way. So um, fast forward 10 years and um, the digital department is now the arts technologies department, which I think tells you also the way that the conversation has evolved. Um, and we've uh, develop these sort of two core um, sort of modes of functioning. And so now on the one side, we focus very much on commissioning and production. And production is extremely important for us. It's about, we are leading the development of, of any form of projects in-house. That isn't to say we don't have in-house development teams. We're not that big an organization. Um, but it is about us building teams and leading those workflows and really understanding what it is to actually build things. Um, that is very key to part of our strategy. Um, so that's the kind of curatorial production side. And on the other side, we have the R&D platform. Now the R&D platform is not a digital platform. It doesn't mean the gallery either, it's a program. And that has evolved um, in the last five years around, um, uh, are kind of sort of part of our requirements and part of our mission 
I realize I'm jumping forward a little bit. A part of our mission is around um, convening art and technology. So that is how creating uh, situations or, or the conditions whereby art and technology can um, uh, come into new and interesting modalities, if you like. And so the R&D platform has, has developed these specific programs. We have a series of labs and we have a report called Future Art Ecosystems, which we can talk about shortly. And that is about doing a number of things, which is having space for experimentation. So ultimately we are, you know, as an organization, we are artist led and it is about how do we support and maintain um, a position for artists um, going forward. Um, it's about creating time and space for that for different kinds of experimentation to happen. It's also about sharing the knowledge. It's not necessarily being in competition with other arts institutions. We are a public arts institution. We are a charity. So it's about sharing that knowledge with the wider sector for the benefit of the sector. Um, and it's also, you know, uh, about how do we communicate these things with our many and varied audiences. And we know that there are the things that come out of say our curatorial program our commissioning program may be for a different audience to our research are more slightly more embedded technically or philosophically uh complex um work you know there are different kinds of audiences and we try and cater for all of those um you know as and when it's necessary so um that is the kind of the evolution and I guess in many ways we're sort of a bit like a startup or a, um, a mini studio within an arts organization and that we've been gradually building been gradually building over the last 10 years to where we are today. Thank you. Thank you for telling us the story how it all developed and it, as you already touched the mission I would actually love to touch upon a different topic. You said that you have different audiences. Could you tell us more what kind of audiences do, did you actually mean? Yeah and I think it's it's also quite a difficult question to, uh, uh, to answer sometimes and I think there is a historical a precedent for thinking of audiences in the cultural sector as a, as a general audience. And we are very keen to move away from that kind of generalization. Um, I know lots of people are doing work in this area um, and it's really something that is, is definitely a, a work in progress for us. So that is to say that we are really thinking about how we, in this convening moment of our work, how are we able to sort of have these quite uh, in-depth conversations about the development of technologies and about how those technologies are um, implemented? Um, how can we talk about organizational change within the sort of realm of the art and tech and broader cultural art, well, I guess, contemporary art and sort of uh, museum sector. Um, and those conversations, <laughs> sorry, I'm just trying to think of the way of, of explaining this, about this sort of many layers. We have this kind of larger layer of, of people who are interested in culture, interested in digital art and who, will, who come to museums and galleries. Um, and then we have this kind of more let's say committed and regular and um, a vocal audience who might be interested in some of the different elements of the work that we're doing. So as I said, that might be from an organizational perspective. So one of our audiences is other art and tech uh, institutions. Another audience is artists. <laughs> Another audience is those involved in the creative AI ecosystem and so on like that. And it's very much like understanding that, um, you know, we don't want to be in a position where we're just broadcasting. We want to be in a position where we're, and I think this is where Web3 is very interesting. Um, we're having a sort of reciprocal relationship with our audiences. Now, this is something that has to develop over many years. <laughs> 
um, because it's not necessarily the sort of historical or the sort of precedent of the way arts organizations have been functioned. And it's very labor intensive. Um, but that's how we think of audiences. I guess it's very much like this sort of in-depth, committed, engaged um, on a very sort of specific level versus kind of the people we're talking to about commissions. And that is to say they're not engaged and they're not interested, but it just manifests very differently. Thank you, Thank you Kay. Uh, you've uh, enumerated a number of uh, directions that uh, Serpentine is currently supporting in terms of new artistic mediums like NFTs, AI, uh, AR, and VR. Um, which of them would you like to highlight in terms of uh, what kind of projects are you currently working on? So maybe I'll, I didn't go into sort of the detail about how the sort of different areas we're focusing on. So maybe I'll do that. And then I can tell you a little bit about um, uh, a curatorial project with an artist called Gabrielle Massan that's coming this summer, uh, which also involves Tezos. Um, so, um, a couple of different things. So in terms of curatorial projects, you know, we are, we are artist led. So we are responsive to the way that artists who work in the, at the intersection of art technology are, are developing projects. So that is to say, we don't decide, oh, we're gonna do an AI artwork. We are, you know, we are continuing our conversations with artists across the field who work in many different ways. And, and looking at where, what we're, you know, what our capabilities are, sorry, I keep saying that, but where we can um, really start to develop a project. And a lot of those projects develop over a number of years. Um, so for example, um, we worked with the artist Ian Cheng, um, and we did an exhibition with Ian Cheng in 2018 uh, called Bob, Bag of Belize, which was the, uh, the sort of, awakening of an AI life form in the galleries. But that had, was the on, part of an ongoing conversation that had been happening over several years that had also included the release of um, a game in 2016, um, actually earlier, 2015. And so so we, we have these very long-term relationships based around sort of our interest in how technologies are developing. So on the other side with uh, our R&D platform and that kind of work, we have a series of labs that focus on areas that we consider to be of strategic importance. So we have a creative AI lab, um, which we run with King's College in London. We have um, a synthetic ecologies lab, which we uh, run with a designer and a researcher and artist called Yasin and Sherry. We have a legal lab, which is focusing on sort of the legal challenges or opportunities when it comes to art, tech and science um, uh, collaborations. And that's, and that's very interesting. And that's come about from our knowledge of doing sort of complex commissions with a number of partners. And then we have a blockchain lab actually, which focuses very specifically on decentralized autonomous organizations. And that is run by two artists called Penny Rafferty and Ruth Catlow, uh, who co-founded an institution called Furtherfield who are doing, have been doing amazing work in this field for a very long time. So with each of those things, um, uh, the labs run on a slightly long-term uh trajectory and the idea is multiple which is to develop to understand um the ecosystem itself then to develop tools or um protocols or whatever is what we deem to be necessary for the ecosystem and then it's also an element of sharing communicating knowledge creation how do we share this information and for who um, there are artistic projects that often come out of these lab scenarios and the relation and, you know, really thinking about um, how can we enable that in the long term. And then um, we also have the our strategic briefing for future art ecosystems. Um, we, we can talk about, about that again, but um, we've just released our third, just in November, we released our third 
version of Future Ecosystems, which is, um, so the sort of premise of that is around um, what we call the development of 21st century cultural infrastructure, which is the systems that support art and advanced technologies um, in its entirety, but also their response to a broader societal agenda. So um, we have released three reports, all of which are available online. Uh, the first was a landscape mapping of art and advanced technologies. The second looked at art and the metaverse, which was really looking at the impact of the games industry and that game technology um, in terms of digital infrastructure, as well as how to how the cultural sector can have uh, or the art sector can have agency in the development of how these um, technologies are rolling out. And the third one was on art and decentralized technologies. Um, and Future Ecosystems is going to continue to evolve where we're really thinking about, you know, we're talking strategically, but now we're thinking, yes, we still do this strategic work, but what can, what are we, what should we be building and what should we be testing? I think it's also worth saying that we're not just interested, hence uh, this sort of dual nature of our program in just showing finished artworks with the process and the development of these projects is just as interesting um, as the finished artwork. So um, it's very much, you know, it's about opening up the black box, I guess, into the, some of these processes and trying to reveal how, um, how some of these sort of amazing creative endeavors have come to fruition. Um, and in doing so, sort of enabling a bit of demystification, and we hope that the art and tech ecosystem will become more diverse um, as a result of that. In, and not just art and tech, actually. I mean, we're very keen that the tech ecosystem becomes more diverse um, as a result of these conversations. And I think it's where, yeah, and we're really, you know, the basis of this is we're really thinking about what impact can art by which we mean the institutions of art and artists and the, and the wider ecosystem can have on the development of technologies. Um, so what we're working on now, there is always lots of projects happening at certain time, but this is um, uh, what's, what's coming up, which is we've been working with this amazing, amazing um, Brazilian artist called Gabriel Massan. Uh, Gabriel is based in Berlin, between Berlin and Paris. Um, primarily a digital sculptor, um, but has also been developing video games, other kinds of digital artworks, was previously doing a lot more video work, but has also been involved in Web3 for quite a long time. Um, and so um, we initially began working with Gabrielle as part of a project or a sort of a strand that we've been doing called Artist Worlds, which is really looking at the role of um, simulation technologies, a digital storytelling and um, virtual world building and sort of enabling um, artists to, to develop their practice while at the same time in, um, as an organization and together with the artists developing innovative ways for, um, I guess, different kinds of audiences to access or to become a part of that project. Um, the project that we are launching is called Third World, The Bottom Dimension. It is a video game. It is an exhibition at Serpentine North Gallery. And there are also Web3 elements to this that we are building on Tezos. The video game, I think what's important in the way that we have been constructing each element of this project is that Gabrielle sees their position as an artist. They are creating the container or the platform through which other creatives and artists can become part um, of the building of narrative and of actually the building of the world. So the video game um, that we will release, it's a PC game. Um, the, the sort of conceptual, if you like, focus of it is um, really thinking through um, sort of Brazilian experience and understanding of your position, um, that position in what is uh, widely called 
or, or is often called the third world. Um, in doing so, what they have done is that they have created um, a series of levels. We have some time. I'm not going to give too much away, to be honest with you, because then you, you need to play the game. Um, uh, those levels have been created with other Brazilian artists to bring about sort of interesting perspectives on uh, your place in the world, wayfinding. I'm really using the mechanics of building a video game to really think through player agency and perspective and all of these kinds of things. So working with other Brazilian artists uh, to do that, as well as a whole team of Brazilian developers and designers and all of this kind of thing. And this is quite an unusual thing to happen in a contemporary art organization. <laughs> um, and uh, we're very excited to be releasing it. So then what we're now doing is um, expanding this kind of world building proposition into the gallery. In doing so, we are creating a hybrid experience. And I think in the aftermath of the pandemic, um, we are definitely, I mean, we were doing this before, but we're more sort of um, thinking and more about this hybrid experience and the way that different audiences access things. I realize now that when I've when you were asking me before, perhaps you're asking me about physical and digital audiences, not just sort of subject specific audiences. Um, but, and I think the way that we've always programmed and we've tried to find different ways for you to access a project via different kinds of platforms and way, ways in. And that is to say that sort of we're using technology is part of the conceptualization of the project. Um, but it's not, we're not using tech for the sake of tech. Um, I think that's also quite important. We are trying to talk about a number of other things, which is inequality and so forth. Um, so on site, we're going to expand this notion of the creation, co-creation of a world into the gallery space. But we're also going to provide um, access to play the video game in a way that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that at home. So it's a very specific experience. Um, and I think, you know, this is a first person game. So what we want to think about is how can we bring people together in the space to play together? I think that's also an interesting thing about the platforms like Twitch, which is like viewing other people playing or like the LAN house, which is like people coming together to play. Um, and what kind of dynamic you create by doing that. Um, and then finally, um, as part of all of this, um, we're looking at a Web3 strategy that involves different kinds of utility and different kinds of relationships. So within the game itself, we've created um, a functionality called capture mode, which is, I would say it's relatively common in various kinds of video games where you can capture your own image or your own scene. Um, this capture mode will be able, you'll be able to capture images and you will be able to capture um, video, up to 15 seconds of video. Another key concept around the whole project is around memory, whether that's institutional memory, how that relates to how communities have maybe become invisible um, in like social histories um, down to various uh, factors such as you know, racism or misogyny or so forth. And what we're keen to do is, is we're using this mechanism as a way of like, of, of um, creating an archive of, of, of memories from different perspectives. And so, and then the, so we're going to have two different um, versions of this. There will be, we're going to create a limited collection with um, a series of different artists and we are um, going to be minting those as, as open editions or high, um, high number editions at low cost. Also for a reason of um, generating funds for some Brazilian digital liter literacy charities in addition to the artists themselves. So this is more like purpose-focused purpose focused, and we'll, we're also 
um, adding some utility around a gathering and community. Then there's the other side, which is you will be able to come on site. And when you pl play the game on site, you'll be able to mint your own um, memory. The idea being that we will create a public archive on the blockchain of these multiple perspectives. And, um, and you know, this is quite a simple use of the technology, actually, of course. But we're also being mindful of our various audiences. You know, we've never had anything like this on site before. And yes, while we also do a lot of research really into the depths of like the tech stacks and all this this kind of stuff around Web3, I think we uh, our sort of first physical on-site manifestation is really about what does this technology do? How does it make sense in the context of how artists are working and working in community and so forth? And also about your relationship as an audience member to the artwork. So um, I have been talking for a long time and I apologize, but that is um, what we're working on at the moment. <laughs> That's been extremely interesting and thank you so much for sharing that. The only question that I have now after this description is like when it's going to be launched. So when the audience will be ready to see that. So publicly on the 23rd of June. So please, you know, get involved online, uh, come to the gallery. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we will be announcing more information in the next couple of weeks. So um, more to be revealed. Yes, sounds amazing. Thank you. I, I believe that after this webinar, the Serpentine Gallery will have even more inspired visitors that would like to uh, see on their own eyes what has been described by you because it, it sounds very promising and, and, and really, you know, Sonia, could well, you I'm please glad you think so. Yeah, <laughs> touching, touching, <laughs> touching the strings of the digital hearts of the community. Uh, please let me get back to the question um, regarding the research, because you've um, mentioned that, and we also know that uh, Serpentine is um, very deep in research work. And uh, also, yeah. from my opinion, uh, there is a misunderstanding in, in the um, I mean, there is a misunderstanding. A lot of people consider non-commercial academic platforms like museums or galleries uh, as an exhibition spaces. You know, they, they, they do not know that it's only like 25 or 30 percent of their daily job. The most of the work and the most uh, important work is hidden. It's academic research. It's investigation. It's... Um, the work to you know to to, to construct the, the the continuously construct and help building the history of art brick by brick. So uh, and um, I was I was happy to uh, hear about some of your research initiatives, like uh, future art ecosystems, uh, the third edition. We are also, as you know, uh, publishing our fuel arts report on investments in art tech ecosystems. So. Uh, I'd like to 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 know more, uh, and and our audience would like to to know more about this initiative. So you've recently published this third uh, issue of Future Art Ecosystems. Uh, it was specifically dedicated to art and uh, decentralized tech. So uh, the short question uh, is: So what topics have been covered in this edition, and what are the main conclusions? Yes. So. Um... Ooh, there's a lot to cover here. <laughs> um, I think it's worth saying just initially, like obviously we are a contemporary art gallery um, and we operate in, an, in a specific context, which is we don't have a collection. So while um, museums, uh, a real key core component of the, their function is around the care and um uh, you know, understanding of those collections and adding to those collections. We have a slightly different relationship to the curatorial. That isn't to say that we are interrelated and we do 
collaborate significantly with collecting organizations, but our mission is slightly different. Um, so the research focus becomes on, um, for us particularly, broadly the serpentine is this relationship between artists and society. Um, and then with each strand that we have, so we have a, a really very exciting civic program that works with local communities and organizations. We have a general ecology program, which is very much looking at the relationship between art and uh, ecology and the climate emergency. And then us um, who are looking at art and advanced technologies, we cross over all the time, uh, but uh, that's very much sort of the basis by which our rate research work um, is done. Um, so in terms of Future Oka Systems 3 and each of the reports really, but on this third one, is that, um, uh, as I said before, um, it's really about the development of the infrastructure for the ecosystem. And it's what we call 21st century cultural infrastructure, um, which are those processes. Um, and we're really thinking about like production, um, distribution and financialization um, uh, in relation to those processes. But then our response, how they, they are not, uh, how they respond to a broader societal agenda in that we don't exist in a bubble and uh, what could be those interfaces between the art field, other cultural fields and broader, you know, we're talking about the tech sector, science, academia, research, policy. The report was also conceived as a way of the art field generating strategy um, itself, if you like, um, a long, a, a while ago, when we were sort of conceiving of the report, we were really seeing that um, there were a lot of things around art and tech coming from the commercial and private sector, but nothing coming from the public sector. So this was also an important factor for us to become part of that conversation around how we can operate. So really with this third report, we were um, obviously uh, focusing on sort of the emerging patterns is how we call it, or the trends or uh, potentialities that are coming from decentralized technologies in general. So also becoming very interested in the different kind of positions that were being taken when we talk about decentralized tech at large from Web3, DWeb, the metaverse even, and so forth, and how those different ways of conceptualizing the space and the development of the space, um, you know, had, had different ramifications. Um, but also understanding that how they intersect with what you might call the Web2 world or what we call um, the legacy formation. Um, you know, and we, that relationship, as we discussed, uh, mentioned before, this kind of how, what are the bridging mechanisms how did these two worlds start to come into a generative and fruitful discussion for the benefit of a public um i'm really also thinking about th there are these extremely important shifts in digital infrastructure taking place at the same time as a shifting in cultural infrastructure and those things are related um, I would say that historically digital transformation within the sort of legacy arts institution has not been so well done. <laughs> it's, my, it's my way of saying it. As in, um, uh, it's very much been, you know, technology has been something that has happened to the art world, maybe rather than sort of being involved in how those things develop for the benefit of the art world. And that is not a criticism of my field. It's just the way that these things have developed. And digital transformation is really hard. Um, and so really thinking about what are the affordances available um, for cultural organizations, particularly from a kind of public or civic focused um, aim. And then how do we enable artists. I mean, artists, we always have to come back to artists. Um, and, you know, 
what is the infrastructure we're trying to build for artists, but most importantly, how do we not create the separation and the artists are involved in the development of this as well? So I think often we find with these kinds of strategic reports that artists are actually absent. Um, it's very important to us that artists are as much a stakeholder in the development of this research as anyone else. Um, and the way that these uh, uh, reports are developed are through research interviews, res you know, desk research, landscape mapping, so forth. So in, in undertaking this re report, what we were looking at is sort of landscaping, the sort of field and understanding what is emerging in relation to art and advanced technologies. So identifying things like, you know, how this impacts production and provenance and the kind of assetification of things or different governance models, the role of art and creative R&D, um sort of other kinds of back-end innovations such as forms of storage ifps and production processes and community processes so really just trying to like um come up with a way of of defining these um sort of emerging uh entities and then what we look to is like where is their potential in art and advanced technologies? And we were really interested in picking out um, these areas, which is our, our creative R&D. And we've been very interested in, for a long time, in really sort of thinking about the role of the art field in creative, in the, in R&D processes more broadly. Um, it's something that has been happening across the, across the sector from policy organizations. Um, so really thinking about that's where there is um, an interesting, I guess, use case for how the art field can be involved in this kind of moment. There's also the delivery of public value. We know that there are different, um, but many ways of discussing publics in the sort of web 3D web space and also in the art field and every field. So it's like really what is the what is the value that we can bring to these discussions? And then the other thing is about, um, oh, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, what the, I guess on the infrastructural, like stru infrastructural level, what sort of other kind of what we call durable structures that can be um, developed in particular when it comes to the interfacing between this kind of legacy and emerging processes um, and then I think what's really important to us was around this notion of interoperability and that as a you know we we are in this report still speculating <laughs> if you like or at least making suggestions as to what can come next um, and, a, and a route that we can see consider to be really important is this notion of interoperability and we know this is this is a, a something that's used frequently in when we talk about the technical side of the development of technologies but also from a kind of individual organizational sectoral sort of level which is can we think through this kind of infrastructural shift is pretty huge <laughs> as we all know and it's not really the role of an individual organization to develop the um it's, it's not possible for an individual organization or entity to develop these things so what are the the paths that enable more interoperability across um arts institutions across different sectors across the art and tech and science and research and policy sectors that can create the conditions whereby we can um, build kind of shared infrastructures, services, modes of developing projects, um, and so forth. So that is kind of the positioning of Future Art Ecosystems 3. And I think, um, you know, we've been really, really trying to, I think this space, it evolves so quickly and it changes so quickly and um, that in itself is a full-time job in many ways <laughs> um, but really oh thank you um, come to the launch <laughs> is what I'll say um, is really kind of 
um, at this point, having sort of really done this mapping and really thinking about um, the work that has been taking place, how can we start to build and how can we start to prototype maybe what's the next phase of the relationship between these legacy organizations and this and this emerging field? And that is our plan for the next three, five, ten years, is really getting some of these projects into prototyping phase. But not on our own, with, with other organizations, other entities, something that's being done in um in community as a sector. Um, yeah, I'm really thinking about, you know, uh, we really do have to think about what are the production and financing uh, ownership structures? How do we think about IP? Um, all of those things in this context, but that's the kind of, that's, that's the route, um, the direction of travel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. I believe Sonia has the, the last question towards you that assembles yeah. all what has been said before Absolutely. But also into the future. Yeah, so the last question would be actually for today about the future. You already touched it a little bit in uh, before. What do, how do you see the development of art and tech in the coming years in future in general? Well, that is a very interesting question. And... Um, it's a very interesting time at the moment because there's really uh, the opportunity to really try and build and test things. I think on a very simple level, actually, um, a number of artists that we are, um, who are approaching us are very, very keen on the video game element of things. And um, we are going to see a lot more sort of contemporary art produced games that is to say that is to say that art um you know i consider video games to be an art in their own right um and the people who develop those are artists but i think we're going to see a number of uh, people who exist within the contemporary art context developing games i mean it's it, it it's it's not new for that to happen you know I think it's also important to sort of reiterate that there is a history here. Um, for example, an artist that I've you know, been fortunate to have a long relationship with, which is an artist called Rebecca Allen, who as an artist was involved in the, the shift from 2D to 3D animation mm -hmm. in the 90s. And she was very much an artist and, um, and was involved in those sort of innovations at that point. And so she was building video games in the 90s, as were um, you know, a number of other practitioners. So that is to say, um, I don't want to make it sound like this has never happened before, but we are definitely seeing a new generation of artists who are, who are coming to us and who with other organizations are, don't just want to like use the game engine, they want to build the mechanics of a game. Obviously, I think Web3, D-Web, this, this world that we are in is going to have a huge impact on the art and tech ecosystem. We are um, looking at a number of different elements of that from DAOs and governance. Um, we're also interested in licensing and ownership. Um, and uh, working on a number of prototype projects there. I think it will be, I, I you know, I can't see the future. <laughs> I'm always loath to um, try and, um, and guess, but I think that also we're seeing a lot more of these sort of independent, entities what in our in future ecosystems one we call the art stack um these kind of adjacent institutions that are either run by artists or run by other entities who are able to get that investment into developing quite complex projects um in many forms you know this might be you know the 
the, a number of places where you can immersive experiences and so forth. But then you also have, you know, other examples of which are, you know, people like Rafik Anadol, who we talked about before we came on, who has really been developing a different kind of process to be an artist. Um, and so I think we're going to see those kind of shifts expand further. Um, I think it's interesting to see that we've already had this sort of first wave of, I mean, of uh, museums collecting NFTs. Um, and, you know, we've seen the result of, say, what's been happening at the Pompidou and other collections. I mean, we know that there were NFTs that have been collected previously, but in this kind of sort of mass acquisition of these artworks, um, I think we will see the sort of role of NFTs. And, and I kind of just mean, I think the role of NFTs or whatever we're going to call them in 10 years shift. Um, but I'm also interested in how, you know, what I discussed before around this kind of idea of a general public about how how the development of what is happening in art and tech can actually influence other ways in which we think about the sector. So like reconfiguring our relationship to audiences is key. Um, so I think we'll see different initiatives using different methods to engage different kinds of people. I find that very exciting. Um, I think we'll also start to think about new ways of measuring the success by which um, we do things, not necessarily taking in maybe commercial or private forms of KPIs. Um, but um, I think there is a, something interesting that happens in this kind of slightly more in the distributive model. And then maybe we might see that in the future, the art and tech sector is just fully decentralized. And, um, you know, there are a number of different, you know, Serpentine is just one node of many nodes who work together to develop the sector. That would be wonderful, <laughs> in my opinion. You know, I, you know, we, we, we love doing what we do and um, we're very, you know, uh, but also we want to be able to lift up other organizations and other practices into um, a very healthy ecosystem. So we could see something like that in 10 years, 20 years, maybe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. Uh, I mean, in the last five minutes, you gave so much amazing tips and beautiful predictions, which, uh, which we would be happy not only to let's say, take into consideration, but also to follow and to expect. So thank you. Thank you for, for being today with us. Oh, thank, thank you, you for so having me. And, and we always want people to reach out to us and to speak to us if they're interested in any of the things that we're doing. Um, yeah. So that's an open, open invitation. Thank you. Uh, I also should mention that a lot of startups from our current Fuel Arts and Tales um, Acceleration Batch are eager to uh, start collaborating with Serpentine Gallery as they grown up. So uh, please expect at least 10 more startups <laughs> right next <laughs> after this webinar and uh, pr proposing and showing their decks and their progress. They are really worth collaborating. Well, it'd be really interesting what comes from the process that you're leading here. So always interested to, to see how these ideas are developing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Solomon, <laughs> don't be disappointed, please, because all the uh, all the records are stored online on our YouTube channel. So just type your lights on YouTube and you'll see all that. But thanks for joining and for expressing your feelings. <laughs> Thank you, Kay, and, again. Um, Thank bye, you very much. Uh, bye, everyone.